Today, on the 26th November 2020, for our last meeting for this year, we have a very special guest, Dave Carter from the UK. So Dave is a professor in biomedical science at Oxford Brookes University. He did his undergrad at the University of York, his PhD at the University of Cambridge, and a postdoctoral work at the University of Cambridge. He set up his own group in 2007. He initially worked on the I think non-coding RNAs, but more recently he has fallen in love with extracellular vesicles. So Dave was a member of the education team for ISEF. He has initiated the development of the 3D animation of EVs and also contributed a lot in the education team as author and narrator in the first and second massive open online course MOOC. He's now also a member of the International Organizing Committee for ISEF 2021. So today is my pleasure to have Dave to give his uh, lecture on cellular response to damage and the role of extracellular vesicles. Don't hold your stress. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carolina and Jan, and, and thanks for the invitation. I hope everyone's keeping safe. So here's, here's Oxford Brooks. It's always like this. Um, Okay, so we're interested in stress response in the lab and, uh, and, and the roles of stress response at different levels. And stress response can occur at both a physiological level uh, with multiple organs, uh, but also at the cellular level. So at the one extreme, we have these physiological stress responses that are multi-organ. So for example, um, if we have some kind of big scare, then, then that activates the sympathetic adrenal medullary system and the, the sympathetic nervous system sends signals to organs and then there's the adrenal medulla releases lots of hormones and, and that's our acute stress, our fight or flight uh, response. And these days I think it's also called fight or flight or freeze response. Now I don't, I'm, the, well, I'm not a physiologist and the point of this is not to, to go into the detail, but say that it, occurs at a multi-organ level. Similarly, the, uh, the hypothalamic um, uh, pituitary adrenal axis and, and, and chronic stress, again, involves multiple organs. And then at the other extreme, we've got the cellular effects of stress. So for example, the heat shock response, the unfolded protein response, the formation of stress granules uh, and other things too. And, and these are going on within a cell. And ultimately the point of them is to allow the cell to become stronger, to increase the probability that that cell is going to survive whatever adverse conditions it's facing. But we were wondering whether there might be something uh, in between those two levels within a multicellular organism, uh, perhaps at the tissue level of different cells interacting with one another following stress. And so we're interested in that intercellular communication following stress. So let's say that we have a collection of cells and, and this cell on the left here uh, gets stressed. And what we're interested in is what, are the, what is the response then from the bystander cells, from the other cells? Um, so obviously this stress cell is not very happy, but what about the others? Um, do they think it's hilarious? Do they, do they get really upset and angry? Or, or do, they, do, they, do they become enraged? Or do they simply not care? So what, what, is, the, what is the nature of this communication? Is there a communication and, and what are the effects? And so to test this, we were collaborating with Professor Munir Akadim uh, at Oxford Books as well. And, and we were using a particular type of stress to begin with, which was uh, radiation and particularly ionizing radiation. Now we're constantly exposed to radiation from a variety of different sources around us. We can have accidental exposure, uh, we can have occupational exposure, we can have clinical exposure, and we can also have environmental exposure. We're always exposed to, to, to radiation at different levels, some, some of us more than others. And the classical theory then of the effect of, of that radiation uh, was that this would happen. So let's say that we have a collection of cells and that collection of cells, we're able somehow to specifically irradiate this one cell in the middle. So we've hit that cell with radiation. And, and previously it was thought that what would then happen is that that cell would get DNA damage, which is true, it will get DNA damage. <coughs> So that DNA damage then needs to be repaired. Um, and if it can't be repaired, then either the cell goes into senescence, so no further cell division will occur, uh, or the, the damage will be so much that the cell will undergo uh, programmed cell death. <coughs> and if none of those things happen, uh, then uh, a mutation can then be, um, uh, will then follow because the, the potentially changes to the DNA that have not been repaired and the cell continues to divide. That's the, the classical theory for the, the effects of radiation. 
But in the in more recent years, there's been a bit of a paradigm shift in, in how we see radiation effects. And, and, and that's in these non-targeted effects of, uh, of ionizing radiation. So there's two main ones that I'm going to mention. I'll mention genomic instability very briefly, but then we're going to talk more about bystander effects. So genomic instability is this effect whereby <coughs> there is instability to the genome, obviously, as the name suggests. Um, but but what, we, what we know from that is that the, the damage that's occurring in these cells can last for actually quite a long time. And even progeny downstream of the irradiated cells can appear normal at times, but then their, their progeny can then uh, begin to exhibit signs of genomic instability. So, so this is kind of long ongoing effect, but there's also the bystander effect. And actually that's the one I want to focus on for most of the talk. So the bystander effect is, is completely crazy. And when I first heard about it, it just completely um, screwed with my mind. And the bystander effect is essentially this. So let's take our collection of cells again and imagine that we can irradiate that central cell so what happens in the bystander effect is that if you look at DNA damage within the population, then yes, of course, you see DNA damage in the cell that you've irradiated, but you also see DNA damage in neighboring cells and not necessarily next door neighbors, but, but actually other cells which can be quite a, a distance away. And so these bystander cells appear to be stressed, they appear to have damage, but they were never themselves hit with radiation. So there seems to be some kind of communication, which could be gap junction mediated. <coughs> so next door neighbors could be sending signals through gap junctions, or there could be some media borne uh, factor, soluble factor that's released out into the interstitial space, to the extracellular space, uh, and, and then is taken up by other cells. And so we were interested in what the nature of this signaling molecule might be uh, in the bystander effect. And, when, I, when, when we first started working on this, um, we actually wondered whether it might be an RNA molecule. And this all started because this, is, this whole bystander effect was something that uh, Professor Manira Kellin was working on. And, and one of her students presented this in a, in a talk. And I was, at that time, I was into non-cutting RNAs. And so I saw uh, his student, uh, her student, uh, he presented this work and, I, and, and I, I, my immediate thought was maybe it's a non-cutting RNA. So that's what we set about trying to test whether it was initially whether it was an RNA molecule. And so these are the kind of experiments we were doing. So Amar at the time was doing uh, most of these experiments. <coughs> and so we had this situation up here. So I've, I've got on the right hand side, I've got what we did. And then on the left, I've got the results. So we have a flask of cells or replicates of flasks of cells that are directly irradiated or controls which are sham irradiated. And then we're measuring, in this case, mean aberrations per cell by doing karyotypic analysis. And so the, the, the cells that were hit with radiation have higher levels of DNA damage of, of chromosomal aberrations, which is what you'd expect. <clears throat> and then we did, the, the again, the, the classic bystander experiment where we, we did the same thing again, but this time we let the cells sit there stewing in their own juices um, for, for four hours. And then after four hours, we, we take the media off that they've been conditioning and we filter it to remove all the cells and then we transfer it onto bystander cells, onto recipient cells. So these cells, these plus are happy, happy cells that have never been stressed and now they're receiving the conditioned media from either the irradiated cells or, or the control cells. And if we measure the levels of DNA damage in the recipients, again, we see that the, the cells here, the ones on the right, that have received the irradiated cell conditioned media have high levels of DNA damage. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so then um, we did the next experiment, which was to test if there was an RNA, oh, sorry, Mark, um, to see if there was a, a, an RNA involved. So we did the exact same thing again, but this time we treated the filtered media with RNAs to remove any RNA and asked the question, does treating the, the, the conditioned media reduce this bystander effect? Does it bring this down? And the answer is it does. And so we've repeated this with, uh, several, we've done this several times now, um, and, and we've, we've done it with different kinds of assays. And it really does suggest that an RNA molecule is involved in the transmission of this crazy bystander. <laughs> so then um, back in 2000, Ten, I think it was, I went to a, a, a conference and I heard about these exosomes, these extracellular vesicles. And, and ever since then, I can't stop thinking about them. So, so we went away from that conference and thought, hey, maybe, maybe this whole signal, this, this bystander effect signal is uh, uh, an EV. 
And so we tested it. We went back to the lab and we tested it. Um, and so um, I don't think I need to, to introduce what EVs are to this group, only just to say that I, I use this, this figure all the time in, in this presentation. And a while ago, I think about a year ago, I, I looked at it in a different light. And it, do you know, this picture reminded me of, I don't know if anyone's seen uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, but um, it looks like Gary the Snail. So you've got the mouth there and this kind of stalky eyes. And now that I've seen that, I can't unsee it. I just, I always see that now, but anyway. Um, but anyway, you know what EVs are, vesicles released by cells and then taken up by other cells, brilliant. Okay, so then the question was, do these EVs mediate the biosender effects? And so Omar set about isolating uh, or at least um, separating exosome EVs. These are, these are obviously, this, this, this is a hangover from the days when they used to primarily call them exosomes. Um, and I need to change that, but anyway. So we can isolate EVs from, from the conditioned media from both control cells and the radiated cells. And, and to all intents and purposes, they look similar. Um, but then what Amar was doing was asking, okay, so we've, at this time we were doing differential ultra, ultra centrifugation. Um, so then the question is, is it, is it the, the EV pellet or is it the supernatant that's inducing the, the bystander? And so this is the effect of the uh, supernatants on the recipient cells. And there's no difference in the levels of DNA damage in the recipient cells, in the bystander cells, when you treat them with the supernatants. But when you treat them with the pellets, the EVs, we see an increase in the damage of the recipient cells, these ones on the right, when they receive the, the, the EV pellet. <coughs> okay, and what's, again, what's quite crazy um, <coughs> is that if you look over time, if you look at these cells for another 12 part, you grow these cells, these exact cells, so you don't need to use all of the cells to measure the levels of DNA damage, you can just do it on a subset, the rest of the cells you can keep on growing, you grow them for 12 more passages for like three more, uh, I, I think I can't remember how it's a month or two, um, and then you look at them again, and you still have high levels of DNA damage, in these, in these, uh, these cells, sorry, my dog's here. No, I can't. No. Um, so you still have high levels of DNA damage in these, in these uh, bystander cells, even after a, a 12 passages of growth. And what's even crazier is that if you take the vesicles off these cells um, and, and put them onto fresh cells again, there's still a, new, there's still a bystander effect, a kind of propagating bystander effect, which is going on. So these cells that have high levels of DNA damage, because a month ago they received like stress vesicles, those cells are still producing more vesicles, which can induce further bystander effects. So it's, there seems to be some kind of genomic instability going on. <coughs> okay, so, so we know, well, we, that our evidence points to uh, EVs uh, and RNA causing some sort of bystander effect. So then we wanted to know what's different about EVs uh, after a two gray dose of x-rays, which is what we were using for our ionizing radiation. And we know that we know that EVs carry a lot of different cargo. So Laura, who's a, a PhD student in the lab at that time, um, she's now gone on to, uh, to, 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 to do other work in Germany. Um, so, so she wanted to know what are the differences in these, in these vesicles following uh, irradiation. And so she started, first of all, she was just looking at sizes um, and by NTA, there didn't seem to be any difference. But when she was looking at them via um, EM, <coughs> it looked like the, cell, the, the cells that had been irradiated were releasing EVs that appeared to be um, a little bit smaller by the EM. Um, and so we're not exactly sure what that means, but they do seem to be smaller. Uh, and uh, so there seem to be qualitative differences between two gray and not gray EVs, the, the, the radiation induced EVs. Um, so she also did some experiments to look at RNA and protein content. But I won't, I won't mention the, the protein changes, but I'll just briefly mention some of the RNA changes because I think it's interesting. So she, she radiated her cells, she isolated EV, she extracted the RNA and she did the RNA sequencing. And, so she, and she also sequenced the, the RNA of the donor cells. <coughs> and what she found was that there were not many, but there are a few genes that were, you know, a few different RNAs that were uh, significantly changed in EVs. They were all upregulated. The highest fold change came from the prime microRNA from the 17 to 92 cluster. So, uh, so this seemed to be the, the highest enriched. It was, it was a hundred fold increase in EVs from two gray cells. But also um, she found that MALAT1, a nuclear long non-coding non RNA uh, was increased. And that was interesting to me because, because I think non-coding RNAs are cool, um, but also because it's in theory, it's a nuclear retained long non-coding RNA. So why this particular nuclear retained RNA was being enriched in EVs 
following uh, stress response was was of interest to us. Um, but also she did some <coughs> some RNAi experiments that, that suggested that when we knock down malatwald, it abrogates the bystander effect. We've also repeated this now with, with knockouts, cell lines with knockouts of, of um, MALAT1. And again, we see that if you don't have MALAT1, you can't seem to undergo this bystander effect. So it seems to play a role. And we're now trying to figure out exactly how it's doing that. So just, just to kind of keep the story moving along, we, we were also interested in whether other stresses can also induce this bystander effect. <coughs> so I'm, I'm not going to show all the data because it's, um, it's all out there now. Um, but we, we tested heat shock and we also tested treatment with, uh, with cisplatin uh, in ovarian cancer cells. So heat shock in, in breast cancer cells uh, and, and cisplatin in ovarian cancer cells. And, and yeah, we seem to see it. And so, so we see it with heat shock and we see it with cisplatin. So there seems to be a, a conserved feature of, it's a conserved feature of different stress types. We also tested whether uh, these produce smaller EVs, again by EM. And, it, and again, we see that at least in our hands, we see a reduction, slight reduction, but, but a reduction nonetheless in the size of these EVs. <clears throat> so we also um, we, we got interested in looking at uh, migration and generally in metastasis, the processes of metastasis. And so we, we were interested in, in invasion and migration. And so Laura Mulcahy, uh, again, PhD student in the lab, uh, was doing uh, these experiments to see whether or not we could measure um, in changes in migration and invasion. And so she's this for those just in case you don't know what this is. So this is a, a major gel invasion assay. So the idea is, is that you have uh, the uh, the media below in this well, and then we have an insert here. And then within this insert, we can put this. Uh, we have this membrane, which this is now the view from side on. So we have a, a membrane which then has a layer of major gel, just like the extracellular matrix, uh, and a membrane with with pores in it. Uh, and so the idea is, is that if the cells are invasive and they're, they're more aggressive, then they can break down the extracellular matrix and crawl through, migrate through and get to the other side and then stick to the other side of the membrane. So the more of these cells that, that get through, the more invasive they are. So here's an example where we've treated the cells, pre-treated them with control EVs. And we do see some cells coming through, but, but not many. So the cells are the purple ones because we've stained them with crystal violet. The, these little uh, black ones here, are, these are the pores, the membrane pores. When we pre-treat our cells with heat shock EVs, we see a lot more of these, uh, of these cells coming through. And we can quantify that, and it's a significant increase. So it seems that, that heat shock EVs significantly increase invasion in our MCF7 cells. And again, we see it with other stress types too. <coughs> So there seems to be going, there seems to be some kind of uh, communication going on between these cells during stress. And it's conserved with different species. So, so we can see it with different stress types and in different species. So it must be important for some reason then, particularly if it's conserved between species. But why would you want to have this? I mean, why, why would cells want to be uh, doing this to each other? I mean, it's so what we're saying then is, is let's say that, that I am a cell and you're all cells. I mean, yeah, okay, in the, in the new world, it's, it's all via digital Zooms and stuff, but, but I'm a cell and I get stressed and I want to share my misery with you. I want to share my pain with you. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want, and it's conserved. It must, must be a reason for it. It's not just that I'm a complete asshole. Um, there must be a reason why I want to make you feel this pain of mine. So what's, what's the potential benefit? And I'll show you in the next slide, but what we think is that, is, and others do too, is that there's also, there's, there's a pain associated with it, but, but there is a reason that it makes you tougher. It makes you tougher. It makes you as a bison cell harder to kill. So it seems to be a way of, uh, it's a warning system essentially. And so <coughs> others have done similar experiments, but we, we, we did this experiment here where we have our, uh, we have our donor cells, so we have heat shock cells and we have our control cells. And again, we filter the media and, and we can collect the EVs. Um, and then we put them onto recipient cells. So then previously what we were doing was we were checking the levels of DNA damage in these. And we were seeing that these bystander cells that receive heat shock EVs have high levels of DNA damage and stress, et cetera. Now what we're, what we're doing is we're not measuring the levels of DNA damage straight away. We're first trying to kill these cells. So we're applying a second stress, a second heat shock to both of these cells. And then we're asking the question, how does this, this whole bystander thing affect the response when we now try and kill the cells? 
And so this is, this is now measuring the levels of DNA damage. And we can see that the levels of DNA damage in these cells here uh, is, is much lower than the levels of DNA damage in these cells here, which means that the cells that have received the heat shock EVs, the, the, the stress, the bystander stress response, now when we try and kill them, we don't get as high a level of DNA damage response as we do these cells on the left. And similar with uh, apoptosis. <coughs> So when we've when we've uh, when we transfer this media and then try and kill these cells, they're harder to kill. There's a lower proportion of, of apoptotic cells than these on the left. So we think that these bystander cells are more resistant to heat stress, and we see similar results with when we directly isolate the EVs, but also with other cell lines and other stress types. <coughs> hey, hey, hey. Okay. So the conclusion so far then. So um, so this is what we think is going on. We need to do a lot more work, but we thinking we're thinking that. <clears throat> Under normal conditions, uh, we get this, this ongoing constitutive release of EVs, but when the cells are stressed, uh, they're changing the flavor of their vesicles of what they're releasing, and then bystander cells will take up these stress EVs. Uh, or as, as Grainer and I, so uh, Grainer over in the US, uh, when I first presented this at the conference, uh, he was there and we, we decided we should call these stress exosomes or sexosomes. Um, but that doesn't seem to call on, so never mind. Um, so these bystander cells then have what could be arguably described as negative effects, which is the DNA damage and the apoptosis, the, the, the pain, the cost of this, uh, but the potentially positive effects, which is greater protection against stress. <coughs> Uh, so we think that this is this is a general mechanism of stress response at the tissue level, um, and we're interested in what these mechanisms are. So that's ongoing work in the lab. And also there's a question of whether we can use this for therapeutic benefit, because I've put these as negative effects and positive effects from the point of view of the survival of the organism. But, but you could also classify these as negative. You could swap them around and say these are positive effects and these are negative effects if you're talking about a tumour. So if a tumour, for example, during treatment, is, is, is responding in this way by, by spreading this signal around, which is gonna increase the survival of the population of tumor cells, then, then that's not ideal. And so we're looking at ways in which that, the implications of that in therapy for cancer, for example, and, and how that could be modulated to improve uh, cancer treatment, for example. So just to thank all the team, everyone involved, um, current and past as well, um, they're a brilliant group, and, and also all the collaborators, this is just some of them, and of course all the funders. And for those who are interested, on the 7th and 8th of December, we're, we're having our UK EV meeting fully virtual this year. And I think with that, I will stop and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you can stop and share. Thank you, Dave. Um... Where is your exosome mug? Oh, well, it's at work. It's at work. Oh. And I've not, and I've, I haven't been to work for quite a while now. So um, I, I did some teaching because I had to go in for some teaching. Uh, but also, it has a crack. It has a crack. So I don't use it. Oh. I just have it as kind of an ornament. Sad times, I know. You should put it in a frame and hang it on the wall or something. <laughs> I've got it up on my shelf as a, as a reminder. For those that didn't see uh, Dave's talk in the first MOOC, that's uh, when he shows the exosome mug for the first time. Uh, that's, uh, that's a while back now, but that's that's great. So we have a few questions. Post your questions in the uh, in the chat box, and then I will ask you to unmute. And I have to see here who is. First, to ask a question. Uh, so, Min Lee, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, nice to see you. Um, thank you so much for the nice talk. Um, I wonder if <coughs> the ABCD motif um, affects the translation of pre mRNA because if you see an increase in the recipient cells, uh, does this mean that it's really in? Increase the transfer, or is in is there some increase um, in the translation as well? Because it can affect the binding of the mRNA to uh, RNA binding protein, right? Yeah, that's a really good question, and and the answer is we don't know. The other thing that we don't know as well is is whether it's changing the stability of the RNA. So so it could be that the motif is making the RNA more stable, um, yes. and so it 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 may not be. A specific loading; it may just be that more of it accumulates, and and 
the very, very preliminary data suggests that maybe it is at a higher level, the RNA. So, so it may mm. be that it's it's accumulating higher. But even then, when you when you when you look at the qPCR data so far, there does seem to be an increase um, in the in the um, in in the EVs relative to what's in the cell. So I don't think it's just about RNA stability or translation. Um, but we haven't looked at that translation. It, it could be. I think it's more likely to be stability, but but it could be translation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Aaron. Uh, can I have another? Oh, sorry. Okay, I have another question. Then Min Lee first, and then Aaron is up. <laughs> yeah, so, that's another question. When you do sequencing uh, and look at the, on the mRNA, how many percentage of this mRNA are full length? Um, I remember from an earlier paper that they found a lot of. <laughs> Truncated mRNA, uh, especially the three prime UTR of this in the EV, yeah. so they think that it's still a, a mechanism of uh, to get rid of the cell to get rid of the truncated RNA. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so I can't put a number on it. I don't know what the percentage is. So Lizzie um, would be the best person to answer that one. But we we do believe that we have full length uh, RNAs. So when you align them and you look at the the, the you know, the, 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 the sequences, it does seem that we do have some, I think there is, they're not all full length. I think there is a lot of, um, you know, garbage in there. Um, but but we do, we also find increased uh, mutation, like increased mismatch uh, rates um, in, in the EVs following the stress. So I can't answer the, the question exactly, but I think there are some full length ones and there are also some, some breakdown uh, some broken down RNAs in there as well. Um, it seems to be a, I can't I can't put a number on it, but but there's definitely a mixture of both. Thank you, sir. Aaron. Hi, Dave. That was really good. Um, I got particularly excited when we got onto the in vivo data. It was really incredible. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you've got any uh, data, any information, or, or plans to look into how, like, I guess the mechanism, the process by which the EVs are transferred from those cells. I think the image, <laughs> yeah, especially in the imaginal so, disc, is like, incredible. Yeah, so um, so that's something that we'd really like to do, and and so sadly, Lizzie and Claire are coming to the end of their PhDs. Um, uh, I, I've asked if they can stay for another two or three years just to, uh, to to keep on extending their PhDs, but uh, um, but I think they can move on. So um, yeah, so so we would like to do more and we started to do some experiments like that. So that's the, the beauty of the Drosophila is you can start to, to knock things down and, 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 and over express things and really tinker in there. We started to do some of those experiments. What seems to be quite interesting so far is that most of those experiments that we've done with tinkering, knocking things down seem to be uh, increasing the transfer, but we're trying to check whether or not that's an effect of the RNAi machinery so it may be that affecting the RNA machinery is having an effect but, but again that's something that we're, we're really trying to pin down at the moment so yes we would really like to do that uh, but also what I would particularly like to do as well is is not just the donor cells and the biogenesis but also on the other side uh, the, the the you know the uptake and trying to establish the the, the the mechanisms of uptake we've done quite a bit of looking at different um, different discs as well and looking at transfer across different discs um, and we do see some as well for example in the internal disc um, and also yeah so we, we tr we've tried playing around a little bit and, and this seems to be in terms of within the, the system the clearest example of of, uh, of transfer also it seems to be an early event so if we if we allow the the transfer to occur early we seem we see it but if we mock it early we don't see it so we started to get a picture. So, uh, yeah. Mohammed, are you done, with Aaron? Or oh, yeah, it was just a, a small comment. Um, I was just <clears> also <throat> kind of interested, in, like, um, kind of the actual process of how that the, they would pass through the tissue as well, and and potentially some cool experiments because that, I think I can't remember what stage it is, but the, there's a point where the the wings actually have like a circulation, um, so you'd have the possibility of looking pre-circulation and after and whether they're traveling through sort of interstitial spaces, I guess, um, uh, before or- Yeah, that working. would be really cool actually. That, 
that would be really cool. And, and we're, we're looking at trying to see whether we could do something along those lines. And we, what we also see is transfer between different tissue types. So between hemocytes mm -hmm. uh, and wing discs, we, we are seeing transfer between those. So, so there's, wow. there is, yeah, it's really cool actually. So, um, so, so we would like to do more of those um, time. Is the... All right, uh, thanks Aaron. So we go to Mohammed Nawaz, please. Unmute yourself and ask your question. If you Good can. morning. Thank you for taking my question. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dave, for the nice presentation. It was really uh, Thank you. informative. I have uh, two questions. One is more technical, another is biological nature. So does this, uh, in one of your uh, experiments, you have shown that uh, DNA damage, uh, the bystander effect of the DNA damage. So my question yeah. is that, is that uh, advantageous for the cells or is the disadvantageous? Whether these mutations or damages are helpful for the cells, especially for the cancer cells, they like it. Not all, but in many cases, our voice versa, if they're normal cells, they will die. So mm -hmm. what, what is your take on that? Um, I, I think it really depends on point of view. I think that Overall, there is a beneficial effect of it because otherwise it wouldn't be conserved. But I think in tumors, I think tumors have co-opted that system, just like um, just like they co-opt many many other systems for their own advantage. So I think that, that that cancer cells are using it to their to their own benefit. So yes, I do think that 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 process is advantageous to to tumor cells because they can use it to help increase resistance. And when you're trying to the problem with the, the current, most of the current, you know, treatments for cancer is that they're just inducing death and stress in, in, in tumor cells. And I think this is, this is going to be going on. And I think that genomic instability as an enabling characteristic of cancer is, uh, it, 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 it's, it is allowing those tumor cells to evolve more rapidly. And I think that um, the combination of, of, of increased mutation rate and DNA damage caused by bystander effects, along with also the, the resistance factor, is definitely going to be helpful to tumor cells. And that's so why we're we, trying to see whether we can block it. So can we also assume that this recurrence or reoccurrence <coughs> or relapse, relapse in the patients can be due to the bystander effects? Because if we, when we add the radiation to this certain area of the tumor, uh, these cells will die. But uh, in the neighboring area, recurrence or relapse will occur. So is it due to the bystander effects, I assume? I don't know. I, I don't think we could say it's due to the bystander effect, but I think that the, the bystander effect will contribute to it. I mean, in a patient, those effects that you're talking about, those are kind of abscopal effects. Um, I think that they, they're not so well characterized in vivo, but I think that they will be contributing to the to the to the tumor progression, to the pathology of that, that, that cancer. So, so I don't think they cause it, but I think they probably contribute to it. So do you have so a technical finally, question, when, when, Mohammed? Brief, brief the, question, brief answer. Yeah, uh, okay, the last question is about the fractions. Did you pull the 10 uh, fractions? And we see that uh, the peak is at seven or eight. So I have been doing this same thing, but uh, I see that after six or seven fractions, we don't see the EVs. So, what was the volume of each fraction? Maybe you collected smaller uh, fractions. No, I think the, I think, I can't remember how many fractions. I think we collected five fractions, but there were, I think half a mil each, usually. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. Carolina, you had a question? And I have a question after that, so. Uh, okay. Carolina, if you would, want to yeah. ask a question <laughs> first and then I'll. All That's right. Uh, so Dave, you're using like a uh, various different stressor, which like, you know, totally different category, like irradiation, the drugs, and then hydrogen peroxide and etc. Do you see sort of like a general effect on in terms of like the cargo and the biogenesis of EVs, <coughs> uh, whether this uh, different type of stressor, you know, generate a similar or different effect on those? Um, yes, that's that's. I'd love to be able to answer that question properly. Um, yes and no. So 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 far the the proteomics that we're seeing do seem to point us towards similar mechanisms. Um, we see certain categories, particularly ribosomal proteins, and I don't understand why. Um, but when we're stressing cells, quite often we see more ribosomal content, ribosomal proteins in those. Um, in terms of RNA, we haven't done enough RNA sequencing and across enough. 
uh, samples to be able to really draw a conclusion there. Um, but I think the problem with both is that the background levels and so the proteomics in particular, I think there's a lot of background from the, the you know, from the FCS. That's, even though it's cleared, I think there's a lot of background from that. So I think it's a bit, so we, we're nowadays, we're trying to do more uh, serum free where we can. So, I mean, that leads into my question, which is, there's a lot of, I was going to call it bias, but, or prejudice, but think that RNA are very important in all the biology of the vesicles. And it's not necessarily true, right? We have to be objective and think about the proteins just as much. <coughs> and, and, and that, you know, following up on Carolina's question and you, what seems to be your own data as well, could many of the mechanisms actually be mediated by protein changes in the vesicles? Carolina suggested maybe subpopulation, different subpopulations <coughs> of vesicles, uh, or or the change of the protein of those vesicles that are released and taken up. I think certainly it can. I think certainly it can. And and um, I mean we we are seeing that when we treat. Also, I didn't show you these data, but but when we treat the vesicles themselves with RNAs, that mm -hmm. seems to reduce their ability to induce bystander effects, at least in vitro. So, so I do think that the RNAs are potentially important, but I, th I think that the proteins do definitely play a role. And, and of course, the other thing about the RNAs is that we, we still, as a field, I think, don't know how much RNA is in each EV and whether or not that is biologically meaningful. Um, so so as, a, as, as a proportion of vesicles that potentially contain microRNAs, for example, um, Mm -hmm. But we certainly, but but I've also heard other people saying that actually, if you look at if you permeabilize our uh, EVs, you can see that most of them do contain RNAs. So there seems to be quite conflicting data out there, and so I, I'm kind of waffling. But 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 I certainly think that the proteins could be very important, and I, and I think that it's probably the combination ultimately that that determines the outcome. And I can't rule out that the RNA is is perhaps responsible for part of the phenotype change. And that the protein is responsible for some other part. I don't know. We need to do more experiments to figure that out. Yeah, that's the really uh, unanswered <coughs> question uh, for the whole field. What is what, what proportion of the biology is mediated by the by the proteins, and and which proportion of the phenotype changes are are mediated by the, the RNAs? You said you were using RNAs. Yeah. Uh, how does that get into the vesicles? Mm -hmm. um, well, I got gotcha you there. Yeah, this well, <laughs> well this, this is interesting is... because it actually is yeah, similar yeah. to some experiments that <clears throat> Giovanni Camusi did back in the in 2008. Yes. I think they published some work on that, yeah. and they used Absolutely. very high doses of of RNAs, yeah. and and that could of course travel with the vesicles and be taken up by the vesicles by the cells when when the vesicles are are given to recipient cells. So. You know how do you how do you how do you control for those sort of issues? Um, yeah, we, so 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 I don't think we can control for those issues because that's a very good point. I'm, I'm not thought of that one before actually, um, but it's also possible that RNAs uh, are on the outside as well, and and we have we have wondered whether RNAs. Because I don't think that the RNAs enzyme is getting into the vesicles. I don't think it is. I think it's. It's it's yeah I, I I'm my working hypothesis is that it is degrading RNA that's on the surface of the vesicle, but it, it could be transported into the into the cell and be having its effect there as well. I can't rule that out. Because when we put when Ganesh was in the lab and, and he put RNAs on top of the vesicles, we couldn't we couldn't eliminate the RNA. Mm -hmm. We still saw RNA. So in our hands, they are the RNA we're looking at from mast cell lines. Was was protected from RNAs, but so that's yeah. and I guess that's a dose question and yeah, depends a little bit on how you how you design the experiment, I guess. So. Yeah, what we see when we when we do it, we see a reduction in the amount of RNA, but not a complete loss. So so it seems that some some maybe I mean arguably some is on the outside and some is on the inside, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's just a, like a messy prep or or whether that's a, a again a genuine result but i've seen it published by other people as well that um so i think george church's group showed that um that when you treat the 
EVs with RNAs, you see a reduction. And if I remember correctly, I think that they showed that the, the small RNAs were being lost on the potentially on the outside and the longer RNAs would be protected. I can't, or maybe the other way around, I can't remember. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's not beyond the realms that RNAs could be on the outside. If you have any more questions, please notify in the, in the chat box. I, I just want to say as well that I'm really happy to see that this field of oxidative stress and, and stress in general and the role of EVs is evolving. We actually mm -hmm. published a paper in 2010 on this topic, as yep. I'm sure yeah. you're aware. It was very crude yep. at the time, right? And we didn't yeah. know really what to look for, but it's really exciting to see that uh, somebody like yourself uh, is really digging deep into the mechanism. So, so thank but you. But that, that, that also, if I remember correctly, that also showed a protective effect. Yeah. Of EV. You may you uh, made your video available. Did you have a question? I can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, yes, if you, have, you, if you have a question, ask it. Yes, I think you hear me. You can yeah. hear you now. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, yes. Uh, hi, I am Yumi. I'm from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I am pretty much new to this field, but I have really uh, just a one question. Uh, first of all, thank you for your very interesting uh, top, uh, top, uh, this presentation. I have uh, one question that I used to show that at the very beginning, uh, you showed the EV images for exosomes from the supernatant of X-ray divided cells. Do you see the larger size EVs uh, such as you know, uh, at the body? Because I think uh, X-ray irradiation induces exosis and as of course the body will be produced, uh, were produced from the, uh, the X-ray rated cells. So just I wonder, both the small size EVs or large size small, large size EV were both produced, and what might be involved in the effect of my thunder tail? Uh, I couldn't I couldn't hear the question completely well, but maybe uh, so. So are you asking if the uh, if the smaller size EVs are the main responsible for the effect compared uh, to? Yeah. Oh well, I'm not quite. Uh, no, just uh, I just I want to. No, that you see the bigger size EV rather than the smaller size, and both might be involved in the you know effect. Uh, of okay, so, so so okay, yeah. So we have we we did do a couple of earlier experiments with larger EVs. So we were doing the ultra the differential ultra simplification. We 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 tried the whatever we were using at the time twenty thousand G spin, uh, and we didn't see so much of an effect with those. So okay. that's where we then focused on the smaller ones. Okay. But um, but to be fair, we we didn't look extensively. Mm -hmm. We uh, we got excited about the small vesicles mm -hmm. and carried on with them. But it is possible that the larger ones are doing something. I think several of other other studies now have also shown that the smaller vesicles have this effect. But mm -hmm. again, I'm not I'm not sure if it's just because of a bias that everyone wants to look at the small ones. Mm -hmm. But we didn't see much when we looked with the large ones. Oh yeah, yeah. And what was the pore size of the filter uh, you use for filtration of the supernatant? The pore size of the filter. For, uh, for, for, for the filter for, for the media, for when we're doing the media, I think it yeah. was, uh, I think it was a 0.2 micron filter. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank, thank you. you very much for everyone for participating in the discussion. Thank you, Dave.